So <coughs> I'm Madan. So I, I'm a director of machine learning at American Express. So here I wanted to give a brief talk on some exciting application that we've used using generative adversarial networks on structured data sets. Normally you would have seen a lot of success for GANs on images and unstructured data sets. So we wanted to share our learnings on how to do GAN on structured data sets. So <coughs> let's get started. So American Express, um, I guess, should need no introduction to this crowd. So we have uh, 59,000 worldwide employees, uh, 114 million cards in four. So what that means is we continuously uh, get information about 114 million cards and customers and we are continuously making business decisions on them regarding their financial risk, regarding their marketing prospects and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of data in play here and hence there is obviously a lot of scope for machine learning and that's where our whole team is set up. So, uh, so we have a, a decision science team that spans across the uh, world across different locations. So we have a large machine learning setup in Bangalore here, um, 250 plus MS and PhD graduates. So the idea here is to first write in-house algorithms as well as apply those in-house algorithms on business problems that are sort of proprietary to us and solve for those problems. So <coughs> what sort of problems do we normally solve? Uh, so our problem solve uh, solving capacity sort of varies from financial risk. So what I mean by financial risk is what is the credit risk of a customer? Will the customer be able to pay back or will he be willing to pay back? What is the fraud risk whether a transaction is happening, whether the incoming transaction is fraudulent or not? That is a suite of risk models. We have marketing models, we have customer service models and so on and so forth. And then a suite of line models. So like what is the ideal credit line to be given to a credit card? and when should it be changed, how should it be managed, and so on and so forth. And all these are automated scientific decisions powered by mathematical models. Each have its own algorithm and entirely machine learning is at play behind this. So today I just want to touch on one particular aspect which is the customer management part of our business. So what I mean by customer management is, uh, so just a show of hands, how many of you here have an American Express card? So we are managing all you people as we speak. So just saying we are not managing you every time, but yeah. So uh, so what we is in it's a more of a virtuous cycle. So when when a new prospect applies for a card, the first decision we have to take is whether to issue a card or not. What is the li limit on the new card? Making de deciding on the credit worthiness of the customer. But once a customer is on our books. There is a lot of decisions that continuously happens around real-time credit management. Whenever you go swipe at a restaurant or swipe in Uber, we are taking decisions on whether uh, you are the genuine person is, is the genuine customer, is he transacting or is it a fraudulent person or is this transaction worthy, credit worthy of the past behavior that the customer has established and so on and so forth. And we also do offline credit management which is basically managing your payments, whether the payments are coming on time and so on and so forth. And if you want further financial instruments, more credit cards, more loans, and so on and so forth, we do further customer underwriting. So this circle is what we call customer management. So before you are into our books, you are prospects, and once you are out, you are defaulters. But when you are actively in our books, we want to manage the risk of the customers that we have today. So this obviously means a multiple uh, decisions, point of sale assessment, which is what I said. Every time you swipe a card, whether to issue that, accept or deny that transaction, take lending actions and assess willingness to pay, manage payments, etc. But all these have to be counterbalanced by customer experience. So we do not want to disrupt any genuine customer uh, just for the sake of doing risk management. So we have to balance all these things. So any model that we produce has to be extremely accurate. Because the event rate of someone not paying us is going to be very low. So we have to accurately identify those very small proportion of customers and take actions only on them. So that is where we have invested a lot in machine learning and in deep learning over the last many years. And deep learning more so in the last three to four years. And we have had multiple successful applications running today on CNN, RNN and GAN. So this talk is something that we have worked on on GAN and we wanted to share the learnings with you. So before I jump into the technicalities of the presentation, I just wanted to bring out uh, 
a photo of the Airbnb I stayed in in my holiday last month. So I was at Los Angeles, and this is a very nice place, and you see a lot of nice pictures and this thing. So I'm just kidding. So, but would, would you believe that this is an entirely made up fake Airbnb? Everything, right from the pictures, the pillows, the lights, the furniture, the flooring, and the text, the caption, the, the owner's face, the owner's name, and the description of the place. It's, if you read it, it will look almost something that an Airbnb owner himself would write. So this is an entirely synthesized data. The, none of this is true. And there is this website, thisrentaldoesnotexist.com. If you just go there and refresh every time, it will ditch out a fake Airbnb every time and across the world. So how is this being made possible? Images, text, contextual captions, everything a computer is generating on its own without any manual input needed. So this is being made possible by a wonderful algorithm, GAN, and which is probably taking the deep learning world by storm in terms of data synthesis and data augmentation and a lot of fancier applications and a lot of much more important applications in medicine and in other retail industries are also happening. <coughs> Sorry. So, okay, another quick show of hands. How many of you have already worked to some extent with GANs? Okay, lesser than those number of people who have credit cards, but still. Uh, so GANs were introduced uh, in 2014 by Ian Goodfellow, and then <coughs> it was the best paper in NIPS, and it took the world by storm as to what can be the potential opportunities with this algorithm. And the whole idea of adversarial training was born. So adversarial training itself is like a very innovative way to use a neural network. And so everyone here would know what is a supervised learning network. There is an input, there is an actual that you have to predict, and then there is an weight training that you do using neural networks, be it an MLP, CNN, RNN, to just discover a function which will reduce the error between actual and inputs. But let's say I don't want to actually predict anything, but I just want to make more of my inputs. So a very interesting idea was to go uh, with an architecture where there are two neural networks where you feed in a random input and you f make a neural network predict a vector of the same size as of the input that you want. And then this predicted, uh, which is what let's call it synthesized data, we are passing synthesized data along with the actual input data to a second neural network, which will try to guess if the synthesized data is looking very similar to data or not. So it will try to discriminate the loss between the two data sets, but not necessarily between X and Y. And this loss is back propagated to both the neural networks. So basically what happens is this neural network tries to differentiate between the two data sets. This neural network tries to make more and more better synthetic data sets, which looks much similar to your original actual data set. So they are pitted against each other like adversaries. That's why it's called an adversarial training. And at the end, what you get is like really nice, like the picture that we saw was something that is very close to actual and nothing you cannot, not indistinguishable to the human eye. So GAN has seen a lot of success, as I said, in the unstructured world where you have images, you have audio, you have text, etc. in make synthesizing image, synthesizing newer data. But what does it have to offer for Amex? So the question that we asked ourselves was, in customer management, we have an even more unique, tough problem for a new credit card customer. If someone, let's say, is just off the campus, like he's just a student and he's just got into a corporate sector, or a very new customer, someone who's just relocated to a country, we don't know enough of them. So, and for them, we have just newly acquired them. So we don't have their payment behavior, we don't have their spending behavior. So it's very difficult to do risk management for these people. So what we do if on the actual data that we have on them today, which might be very limited and very low quality, if you were to build a model, any supervised learning model, it will suffer a lot due to lower volumes and the model is generally weaker. So generally in our low tenure segment, we normally see a lot more customer experience, disruptions, etc. And we wanted that to be solved. So what we thought was, what if we solve this volume problem by synthesizing GAN like a synthetic credit card customer and add them back into your training data? So there are no such customers. I'm just creating synthetic data points, but I'm not using them to take actions. I'm not denying credit to anyone, but I'm just using them to stack up my training data. And then actually now I have much higher volumes and can I build a stronger model? 
So that was the question that we wanted to ask. And how did we go about doing that? So first challenge that everyone here uh, has to sort of recognize is GAN, the literature, if you go read up on GAN today, everything is on images and unstructured data sets. There is not much literature on how to work with a neural network like this on structured data set. And when I mean by structured data, all we have on our customers, we don't have their photos or we don't have voice recordings or not much of text also. All we have is numbers, how much you are spending, how much you are paying, what is your credit history, what is your credit score, etc., etc. So these are all numbers and categorical information. So how do we train a neural network on these sort of information? And a pixel is homogeneous. A pixel can always be exp explained by red, green, and blue. But uh, what data we have is very heterogeneous and very high dimensional. So what I mean by heterogeneous is we have amounts, like what is your spending amount, could be in a decimal value, could go from any negative value to a very high positive value balance. A credit score, something like a credit score could only be a three digit value between 600 to 850. Or whether you are delinquent or not could be a binary indicator and so on and so forth. So think of it, neural network is a weight training method. So it's, it's obviously going to be much better if all the, your data points, all your x1 to xn is homogeneous. But if each of them are in different scale, different meaning, different connotation, it becomes much difficult. So how do we solve the heterogeneity problem? So these are all some initial challenges that we faced on using GAN on structured data sets. So what we thought was, so we have gone through this journey for almost a year now. So okay, thanks for the music. Oh, is it from my phone? Okay. Sure, I think so. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, so <coughs> we wanted to share six key learnings on uh, how to work with GAN on structured data sets. So the intention is like the last, the next three pages, when you go out of this room in the next five to 10 minutes, you will be at least having a general outlay of if you have a structured data set and if you want to apply GAN on that, what are like possible pitfalls and possible methods that you have to follow through. So <clears throat> the first thing is, is true of any uh, weight training methods. I, people who have built a logistic regression here would know that it's most important step here and it has come back in vogue in with neural networks like after the boosting and bagging phase. So even in credit card customers there are like extremely high spenders or an extremely highly affluent credit card customer. So there are variables which are going to be extremely highly valued or if you're doing a corporate credit card there will be companies with extremely high revenue, high employee count and so on. So how do we affect sort of treat them before you do a weight training. So if you are doing a boosting or a decision tree process, these outliers do not matter at all. You, will, you can easily put them into a separate part of the tree branch. But in a weight training, you will have to do the truncation before you do any other step. So this is, so whatever I am saying, these six key learnings, uh, I would recommend that you execute in order. So the first thing would be to do an outlier truncation and the best way is not a min max or any other form of truncation, but to do a P1, P99 truncation because you do not even want your weights to be uh, moving towards the tail. So you want to cut out the tails before you start doing this uh, neural network training. The second part is something uh, key for uh, American Express itself. Like because as I told you, there are many different kinds of, there is an amount, which is a decimal, which could go from negative infinity to positive infinity. But a credit score could only go between 600 to 850. Or a different, our customer tenure could only start from zero and count onwards till like a few months or a few years. So again, uh, GAN and for that matter, any other neural network suffers a lot if you were to just use them in its continuous form throughout in its own scale. So GAN is best worked with when you bring them all to a single scale, which is what we do so much success in pixels because all of them are in zero to 255 scale. And if you can do a z-score standardization before you do anything else, and bring them all to a zero to one scale or a minus one to one scale, your GAN uh, convergence will be much better as well as much faster. And the third point is, this is something you would not see in the literature today, like how do you do missing imputation for GAN? Uh, because we have searched a lot and we didn't find anything. So how do you do, like today again, customers, we do not have all the piece of information about all our customers. For some customers, we might not know their verified income. For some customers, we might not know 
anything about their uh, how much they are spending externally, etc. So we might not know their credit bureau information. So, but still you will have to create, if you lose all those customers from your analysis, you're already suffering from lower volume. So your models will become even more weaker. So without dropping those records, how do you treat these missing imputations? So the general uh, way of doing missing imputation in neural networks, everyone would say that do a sort of an KNN based imputation, but KNN based imputation suffers big time in GANs. And we have seen that a median treatment works much better in GAN as compared to a KNN based imputation. And the last one is an optional uh, point, but still very valuable if your data has a class imbalance. If it has a skewed dis distribution, all your variables as a large class imbalance, GAN will suffer again in modeling those things, creating synthetic data points around those variables. So if you can use a Boxcox transformation to bring them into a normal distribution, all the variables into a normal distribution, this again would be very valuable. And I'll stress again, it would be better if you do this in order, first treat outliers, then standardize, then impute, then normalize. And then, so this is, as everyone else in today's presentations have said, half of, not half, 90% of machine learning is just data cleaning and data processing. And this page just tells you like, the success of GAN lies in cleaning your data and bringing it to this point, then it's just a click of a button, you can run GAN. So, yeah, thank you. So, <coughs> point five is, okay, now you've built GAN, you're, now you started seeing synthetic samples. So how do you, there are some Airbnbs which might be absolute bullshit. It might have pictures of an, instead of a house, it might have pictures of a castle or something, which is not very realistic. So how do you pick which are the good synthetic samples and lose the ones which are not? So here we have defined a principle of orthogonal selection. So you'll have to identify those synthetic samples which are orthogonal to your actual data points. So if you have already some data points of some nature, so the whole point of data augmentation is to create synthetic samples which will aid your initial model. So you will have to create, pick those, pick a strategy which will do ensure that your new data points are orthogonal. And the last point, okay, now you have picked orthogonal samples, do you want to use them as is? This is again something that you will not see a lot in literature. You will have to treat the synthetic samples again. So now it becomes a sort of an complex or an counterintuitive cycle. Like you want the computer to tell you a synthetic data point, then you want to manually intervene and change the synthetic data point to look something like actuals and then use it. I know it looks sort of fishy, but it works this way the best. So uh, if you were to, so for example, a credit score can go only from 600 to 850, but if you're going to give me a synthetic data point, let's say a credit score of 2,900, that makes no sense to the model. It will unnecessarily kill the model's efficiency. So you'll have to first address out of range values before you can actually use those synthetic data points. So these are the six key learnings that we wanted to review. So before I show my results, I just wanted to uh, uh, sort of embrace you to a potential pitfall of GAN, which is called mode collapse. This is true for images, any sort of uh, GAN that you can build. So when you are building a GAN, you might see that the results look good, uh, your average predictions are looking very closer to your actual predictions. But what we will see is that this is a sort of distribution as we train GAN with more steps, we might want to see a nice distribution with a good distribution of values. But, and the average, when you compare this average with your actual data, real data's average, it will look good. But what you might actually see is all of them collapse towards the mode. All the values just generally, you are not getting a distribution of synthetic points. You are just getting the same values again and again. But when you take the average, the average will look good. So this is something that you have to be very careful about. How do you solve this? To solve mode collapse, you have to significantly increase the complexity of your generator and discriminator. Add more dropout or add more layers, and then that's the only way to solve this. There is no straightforward way, but this is something you have to solve case by case in your problem. So we have done the, all these steps, solve the pitfalls and all, and then what we see in our credit card problem is that for when we create new synthetic low tenure credit card members, they look very intuitive to the actual people. So uh, someone who's a defaulter is much more credit hungrier. Defaulter synthetic sample is much more credit hungrier than a non-defaulter or a defaulter is much more utilized on his credit limit is like 
very high balance on his credit limit or his credit score is much lower. So you see that the synthetic data points that we can get from GAN is able to help us actually mimic our portfolio much better and bring in more volumes which can enable us to improve. So when we added it to our uh, models, we were able to see significant jump in model performance which is mainly precision and recall of our models and just by without having to collect more data about our customers with existing data we can actually give them a much better experience. So um, that's my last slide. So what uh, we are seeing is GAN has a lot of value even in structured data sets and GAN will provide a lot of incremental risk prevention to American Express as well as make our card member experience much, much better. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, I'll take questions if any. Sorry. Uh, uh, hello. I think the mic is coming. I think there is one. To yeah, we have time for only one question. Sorry. Okay, we can speak outside afterwards. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I want to know that because uh, you are, uh, as you told that, uh, you are working on the less tenured customers, like uh, using GAN uh, against the less tenured customers. So this is before uh, selling the cards or after selling the cards, when you are uh, like using that. This is after they come into our books. So we have already issued them a card. Now we want to do active management of their risk. That's when we do it. Okay, so now then Guys, only one second. If you have any questions, just meet us outside or we have our booth here. I'm going to be there all day, so please uh, just visit the booth and we can chat more. Yes. So, GAN will work for uh, text or uh, images or uh, audios. So, GAN will work for, for which, GAN will work for giving which performance in the text or image or an audio. So, that is the more standard use case. Okay. So, everyone has proved that GAN works for images and text and audio. Okay. So, this is something new. So, for images we can speak separately, but that's much more proven. Okay, fine. Okay.